large-scale plant, the vivoleum feedstock is renewable and unprecious and responds to the need of a shrinking market with greater supply. The dance of capital appears in full flower. Finally, it was time to introduce Reggie Watts, the dying Exxon janitor who had volunteered to be turned into fuel. And now we begin the tribute video to Reggie Watts. Worked in maintenance for a while. Moved up to uh, maintenance too, started doing cleanup, toxic spill cleanup. After uh, I heard from the doctor that I was gonna die, I felt like I had something to live for. Can you switch this off? Could this is Can you switch it off? I think I'd like to be a, a, a candle. There's just so many uses for a candle. I mean, you know, like if you, if you want something romantic, like that'd be nice to know I was a candle on table, you know, when people, uh, when they first met each other on a date. <laughs> I think that that would be great. I'd love that. That'd be, that'd be a hoot. This is a funerary observance. I mean, this guy died. Switch this off before This man died. It's people. <laughs> it really is. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry, but we've been uh, cut off. Apparently, we're not allowed to have a funerary observance for a man who's died to make a product possible. And I'm, I'm being, uh, you, why, you, are you allowed to do that to me? I, what? Bridget Watts was an Exxon Mobil employee, and these are actually 30 or 40 percent from his, his actual work. So this time there's really 80 percent? 80 percent, I'm the sorry. The remaining 20 is from what? The remaining 20 is just, you know, bind binders, bonders, uh, to keep it together. We have to think in Excuse such a case. What are your credentials yeah, with Exxon Mobil? So, what is it? Sorry? That, what part of his body is it? Last, please, sure. Oh, and he's not with Exxon, not with National Petroleum, nothing? Boy, oh boy, they better scream it. You guys love better for you. Let them know. Now, thank you. Hey. Shut it down. Shut it down. Now. Had we actually made the oil people think about what they were doing? It was hard to tell, and there wasn't much time left to figure it out. Big oil was already destroying the planet, and not just by speeding up climate change. And this house right here, it used to be on this side. No way. Yeah, it was over here, we moved over there. You know, I could only take it like two or three days a week coming down here to work. And this year for hunting season, I mean, I didn't kill nothing. I just wasn't in the mood to kill. And you know, after seeing everything else that was dead, just wasn't in the mood. I mean, you know, not that I'm a big killer, but I like killing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really just amazing when you go down river, some of the ponds that we used to fish in are now almost like a bay. For decades, the government had ignored scientists' warnings and let industry carve up the wetlands that protected New Orleans from storms. About a million acres of land has disappeared since 1930. It was done canal by canal, oil field by oil field, port by port, parcel by parcel. It was, if you will, death by a thousand cuts. The governing mindset, culturally and legally, was if there's an impact, we'll deal with it later. And in some ways, it's, you know, this is a preview of what the rest of this country and the rest of the world have in store for them. When Katrina hit, the wetlands weren't there to diminish its force, and the levees didn't stand a chance. So the real culprit for the destruction of New Orleans wasn't just a big hurricane, but greed dressed up as progress. What produced this tremendous improvement in technology? It was self-interest, or if you prefer, greed. The greed of producers who wanted to produce something that they could make a dollar on. Greed had caused the biggest catastrophe ever to hit the U.S. And now, the government was handing out billions of dollars in rebuilding contracts. In other words, 
letting greed solve the problem. There has been this idea that it is government's responsibility to replan the construction of New Orleans. It's better to leave it to the market. We wanted to take a closer look at how the market was fixing the U.S. Gulf Coast. We're on our way to the Gulf Coast Reconstruction Conference at the Washington Convention Center. We're gonna to talk to a number of people who are busy reconstructing New Orleans. Yeah, watch out. There are many silver linings to this horrendous disaster, and with it has come an incredible opportunity. I'm optimistic when I see a room full of folks who want to take advantage of the opportunities, and that's a good thing from our perspective. It's a great thing. Well, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like the Israelis say, you know, once in a while a good crisis is not bad. You come up with new things. We were seeing a lot of new things. But wasn't this supposed to be about Gulf Coast reconstruction? We're especially interested in Gulf Coast reconstruction. And uh, is this, does this have anything to do with that? This is uh, for bomb detonation and ammunition storage. Mm. Perimeter and physical security, uh, mainly anti-ram uh, road blockers. This particular unit can be used in military applications. Wow, so it's a real like catastrophe mm -hmm. toilet, basically. All this stuff would be great for the people of New Orleans if they were going to fight a war. Where was the stuff about helping people? Ah, here it was. The pavilion from Central Asia. Kyrgyz people are ready to help the uh, people of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama by erecting yurts there for them as a temporary shelter. <laughs> And here is the yurt. Oh my god. This is it. You can cover it up, build a fire, you can open it up, and if there's a flood, you can just take it up in less than an hour. And they're interested in sending one free of charge to Louisiana as a test if you're interested. So yep. The yurt was the only solution here about helping people, but the government reps didn't seem very interested. There's no money in yurts. We decided we could outdo everyone at this conference and beat the free market at its own game. We would invent the ultimate disaster technology, a device so sophisticated it could protect anyone from pretty much anything. But it would cost so much that only the richest businessmen could afford it. They kind of just flatten out. Yeah. The only question was, what company would make such a thing? You've got to think Halliburton. For they are the ones who do the research to make the mud, to build the tool, to run in the well, to make the test, to log the zone, to set the packer, cement the pipe and fire the gun, to perforate, to pump the gel that carries the sand, that pops the frack, completes the well to produce the crude that runs the world for all the people all over the earth who live in the house that oil built. Halliburton has been the world leader in extracting profit from every kind of disaster. They made billions off the first Gulf War and its sequel, and hundreds of millions off Katrina, all paid for by the U.S. government, whose vice president was once their own CEO. If anyone could make a killing from total disaster, Halliburton would be the one. This morning, we got up really early, drove up to the uh, very fancy hotel, which shall remain